This is the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Ash, and this is episode 62. Could Bitcoin change social media forever? Let's go. Welcome back to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. So excited to have you this week. Today's guest is Ryan X. Charles. He is the CEO and co-founder of Yours.org and the former crypto engineer at Reddit.com. Yours.org is basically a Bitcoin-powered social media platform which focuses on paying original content creators for their work. If this sounds familiar, it's because I did an interview on Steemit, which is also a social media backed by a cryptocurrency, but not Bitcoin. So this is Bitcoin specific, and we go into a lot of the details about why Ryan chose Bitcoin, what the advantages and disadvantages are using Bitcoin to power your social media platform. But ultimately, the goal is the same, to pay content creators for their original content. It helps build community and rewards people rather than just giving away their content for free on Facebook or Reddit or YouTube. The neat thing about yours.org is that they have something called micropayments, which means that you can give even less than one cent worth. Since we're dealing in Bitcoin, which is divisible many, many, many times greater than a US dollar, for instance, which is only divisible in a hundred parts, you can give fractions of a Bitcoin to people that you want to reward for the high quality content that you appreciate. Not only does this help create a community, but it helps get the content to the top and get noticed because people are putting their money where their mouths are. So sit tight, check out how cryptocurrencies can be incorporated in social media to build a network and a community and see if this is a way that maybe you, if you're a content creator, could join a community like this and start generating some extra income. Also, the Liberty Entrepreneurs Tribe, which is a private Facebook group, is growing with a lot of very interesting digital entrepreneurs from around the world. So if this sounds like something you're interested in and you believe that you could add value to a group like this, Send me an email at info at libertyentrepreneurs.com. Send a message on Facebook or tweet at Liberty E Podcast. Let me know how you can add value to the group and we'll try to get you in there. I'll shut up so we can get right into the interview with Ryan X. Charles of yours.org. Hey, Ryan, welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Hey, Ash, really good to be here. So Ryan, get us started. Give us uh, what your passions are and who you are and how you found out about cryptocurrency. Sure. So uh, I'm I'm a former physicist who got interested in Bitcoin in early 2011. And I was interested in it because I thought it was fascinating that it was possible for there to be decentralized money. So for about two years, Bitcoin was a hobby of mine. And uh, in 2013, uh, the Bitcoin community was going through sort of a, a, a growth spurt. And I became, uh, basically I realized that it was big enough that I could make a career out of Bitcoin. So I was getting a PhD in physics at the time and I decided to leave my PhD and go full-time Bitcoin. And so uh, for the past, let's say about three and a half years, I've been working on various projects in the Bitcoin space. Um, I've worked for two different Bitcoin companies, BitPay and BitGo, uh, and I also was the cryptocurrency engineer of Reddit, uh, which is sort of its own little story. Uh, And now I'm co-founder and CEO of Yours, which is a a social media app uh, with uh, powered by Bitcoin payments. Right. So it's similar but different than Reddit. How is that? So I worked at Reddit uh, for a short period of time. It was only four months total, so it's a very, very short period of time. Um, What happened there was uh, I was recruited by uh, the CEO of Reddit at the time, whose name was Yishan, and Yishan left the company after I was there for only a month and a half, and that basically killed the cryptocurrency project that I was working on. What yours is, is an attempt to solve some problems that I see with Reddit, but not just with Reddit, 
problems that I see with other social media apps, um, which are basically people are creating content on Reddit and other social media uh, websites and apps, and they're not being paid anything. Uh, and this is, this is in the eyes of many of these content creators is a problem. They would like to be able to create, you know, the, you know, th this great high quality content that they're creating and be paid for it because it's, you know, if it's valuable, uh, it should be possible to earn money for this. So we're trying to create a platform that's very inspired by Reddit, but that also has a payment system built in uh, and, you know, gives people a reason uh, and, and the ability uh, to pay for content and get these content creators paid. Yeah, because right now there's a lot of people out there creating content on other people's platforms, Reddit or Facebook or Twitter, and they're not necessarily drawing traffic back to their own site, which is when then maybe they could run ads or maybe they could sell a premium subscription or sell webinars or courses and stuff like this, eBooks. Right. But what, what yours does is it, it allows you to make money on your content, but without having to drive that traffic back to your site. Your site's most likely going to be a lot smaller than say Reddit or eventually yours. So you can leverage the network effect of some of these blockchain based social networks, generate revenue for yourself rather than having to bring it to your site and convert it. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, let's just consider this for a minute. Uh, what some people do, some of the high powered, uh, let's, let's say Reddit users, cause Reddit's a good sort of example. Some high powered Reddit users are create really, really great original content on Reddit itself. But since Reddit has no built in monetization mechanism in order to like actually turn this into a business, you have to go way out of your way to find a way to do this. And it's really not easy on Reddit because Reddit doesn't even make it easy for you to drive traffic to your own website. Uh, so it's just really, really hard. Uh, it's really hard to leverage a strong Reddit presence uh, uh, for you know for money somewhere else, uh, and so there's there's no good answer to that. Uh, some other social media apps are a little bit better, like YouTube, for example. YouTube does have built-in monetization. If you're a very very popular uh, YouTube artist, uh, you can earn money on YouTube, but it really only works for very very popular artists because it's all based on ads. So, you know, we're, we're trying to create something where uh, something that works for a larger fraction of people uh, at, you know, allowing them basically to not have to go way out of their way to monetize their work. The monetization should be built in. Yeah, I know one of the key aspects of the Yours Network, and I think it's yours.org, is micropayments. And this is something that's been discussed in the Bitcoin space since I can remember and I got active in around 2013. How can you use micropayments on yours.org, the, the blockchain-based social media, to reward content creators when it's difficult for micropayments just in general currently? Yeah, so the, basically there are two problems here. Uh, you know, the, the, the user-facing problem, the one that really matters to users is basically how and why do you pay for things on the internet? So right now, uh, most social media, most traditional media is very much monetized by ads. So the way this works is like, for instance, uh, on Reddit, Reddit, the company earns money by placing relevant advertisements next to the content. Okay. So Reddit, the company earns money. They don't give any of that money to the users. The users don't earn anything, even though the users are the ones uh, creating the value. Now, in fairness to Reddit, I like Reddit a lot. Reddit actually doesn't earn very much money from this. And so part of the reason why they don't uh, pay the creators is because there's not really anything left over. But a, a slightly better example might be Facebook because Facebook actually is earning a lot of money. Uh, for various reasons, Facebook has done a better job uh, you know, with, with monetizing based on ads. Uh, and they don't pay anything uh, uh, to the creators. What, what we think uh, is that by incorporating micropayments into the app, we can, we can provide a mechanism to allow people to pay the content creators. But the problem is that we wanna give people a strong reason why to pay. And so this is what we call the product problem. The product problem that we face is giving a reason to people to pay for things on the internet. So let me explain you know, the, the, the problem. If you see an article and you read the article and you like the article, and there's a button at the bottom of the article that says tip the author $1, 
you may or may not click that button, or it could be ten cents, it could be one cent. Uh, you know, maybe if it's less money, you're more likely to pay. But on the other end, like you know, if you've already read the article, you know, why would you pay for it? A lot of people wouldn't. A lot of people just aren't interested in paying for something that they can get for free. Some people are. Some people are nice. Uh, but but nonetheless, like it, you, it's not very good for the content creator if the only way they earn money is is from a direct voluntary. A sort of like not just voluntary but like you know uh, uh, donation model yeah donations right so we want to find a different way we think it's possible to use payments from the payer or from the consumer of the content to the creator but also provide incentives uh, for the person paying just like in the real world like when you when you buy an item from the store you have a clear reason for paying. It's it's not like you can just get it for free, but then you just choose to pay. Like if you buy a cup of coffee or something, you you can't get the coffee until you pay for it. So we're trying to create uh, incentives to encourage people to pay, that they need to get something out of it. And there are basically two things we're looking at. Uh, one is either there's a profit motive. You actually earn money if you are good at paying the right people. Uh, and this can be done by sort of just very wisely chosen uh, payment scheme. Another one is that you actually pay to get access to something. So for some pieces of content, maybe you can't consume it uh, until you pay for it. So this is the this is the product problem. This is something that we've put a huge amount of thought and effort into and have talked with our, our users to find the right way to do this. The other problem is purely the technical problem of making micropayments possible. And for a lot of reasons, it's really actually quite difficult at a technical level to make micropayments actually work for people. And so that's, that's where most of our time has actually been spent so far, is just making it technically work. Uh, so those are the two problems. It's sort of like how and why would you pay for things, but then also making the payments themselves actually uh, work. Yeah, so just with the assumption, I've read some of your articles, you're very well written, and I've watched uh, some of your videos, and let's just make the assumption that the micropayments functionality is all set up and working, and it's, it can just be black box at this point. Since you now have the ability to do micropayments, now you don't have to have a million followers on YouTube, for instance, in order to start getting paid on the, the Yours Network. Maybe I have a hundred followers that are very dedicated, love the content that I create, and I can start generating some type of revenue on my content from those hundred people that are constantly promoting or paying me for that content. Whereas if I have a hundred followers or get a hundred watches on YouTube, I mean, I, I'm not making anything. I, I, I can't even enter into the game. I find that really interesting because it, it is, it seems like it's, offering a lot more surface area, if you will, to attract new content creators, whereas YouTube is going to lose that edge, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. So I think that you know, there, are, there are a lot of, uh, I think this opens the doors for a, a lot of people to create more and better content. Um, you know, on YouTube, you can only monetize stuff if you're very popular and the type of content you're creating is very suitable for ads. So for instance, you know, there are uh, there are women on YouTube that have very popular accounts and they earn money by promoting, uh, you know, uh, uh, makeup, uh, makeup companies. And it so happens that the material, the content that they create on their YouTube channel and combined with having a large following uh, is attractive to uh, makeup company uh, companies that want to advertise, you know, their their makeup products um, so that they're able to monetize. But not everyone is producing in content where it's possible or easy to monetize through ads. So, you know, by creating, you know, by building the payments in and providing other incentives to pay, it, it just opens up the doors to, you know, lots of other types of content that people will be able to monetize. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see the different models of incentivization for payment that you guys incorporate you know anything from a paywall which the wall street journal has used some may say successfully 
versus a more like donation based model where someone wants to reward you for a great article, but they don't want to give you a dollar and they can maybe give you a cent or two cents or something like that. Uh, it's, it's very, very interesting, especially since you don't have your own blockchain dumping inflation every day like Steam do, Steamit does or the Steam blockchain. So you're not able to just use new money that's being created to reward your users. You know, let's, let's compare and contrast uh, yours with Steam, who I interviewed Ned Scott, the CEO of Steam, a couple weeks ago. I, I don't have the episode number off the top of my head, but you guys and yours decided to build on top of the Bitcoin blockchain instead of creating your own, which I find very interesting. Can you give us a couple reasons why you chose Bitcoin? Sure. So, you know, just to just to give a, a bit of background here. So Bitcoin is the first, you know, decentralized uh, digital currency. Um, it's the biggest blockchain by a number of different metrics. Uh, it's the, has the most value. It's about, it's more than 10 times bigger than the next closest, uh, uh, competitor, which is Ethereum measured by sort of how much value is stored in it. Uh, it, it about, if you look at all of the value, like all of the money that's stored in all of the blockchains and cryptocurrencies put together, uh, Bitcoin is something like 85% or roughly speaking. Uh, so it's most of the value is stored in Bitcoin. So it's just, you know, cr cryptocurrency is at a very early state right now. Uh, and there's a lot of value in just using the most popular one uh, because it basically gets the job done. Uh, it allows people, you know, it, it, there's the biggest economy. So when you earn Bitcoin, there are a lot of places where you can easily spend your Bitcoin. Or if you want to convert it to dollars or other fiat currencies, there are many exchanges you can use to convert it. So there's a lot of power in just having a large economy around Bitcoin. That's really the, the strongest reason uh, to use Bitcoin. Um, there are also some technical reasons that are very similar. Because it's the biggest one, there are many pieces of software, many, many kinds of documentation, many other companies with products and services that we as a company can, can, can use and can partner with um, that make our lives easier as a business. So we can leverage, for instance, uh, you know, these innovations that are occurring. Right, well, for instance, with our micropayments technology, um, our micropayments technology is based on something called the Lightning Network, which we did not invent. Um, we read their papers and we created our own solution by, you know, by you know reading their uh, theoretical description of how this would work. So we didn't have to invent um, the theory of how our micropayments would work. Uh, we just had to write the software for it. So it was there's there's a lot of uh, ju there's just a lot of power both for us as a business and for our users around simply using the biggest one. So that's really the primary reason why we're using Bitcoin and not, not using a different one. And I'm sure that another reason is security and scaling issues with some of these smaller chains. They could be 51% attacked or taken over much, much easier than the Bitcoin blockchain. And, you know, yes, we're having scaling issues in Bitcoin right now, but it's already scaled to millions of people. Whereas who knows what the Steam blockchain, for instance, would be able to scale to. You've already got, I mean, if you guys had a couple million people using your yours network, I'm sure you'd be really thrilled. Bitcoin already shows that it can handle a couple million users. Uh, so I, I think that is another key aspect of using Bitcoin. The thing that I'm concerned about, probably because I'm just not knowledgeable of it, is Steam and I keep coming back to Steam because you two are really the only two blockchain-based social media networks out there right now, as far as I know. They have a blockchain that inflates, that they have control over. So there's new money all the time available to the Steam community to pay out the Steam content creators. Since you've piggybacked off the Bitcoin blockchain, not only do you inherit their security and all of the companies writing new code for it, but you also incorporate and inherit the difficult aspects of Bitcoin. For instance, you don't have control over the inflation rate. You don't get it first to divvy it out like Steam. So now you must have a revenue model to keep paying your content curators. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So there are, there are ups and downs to using Bitcoin as, as compared to inventing our own new currency. Um, what, you, what you said is totally true with Steam, and with, there, there are a few other projects that are in progress right now. There's one called Scenario, 
um, you know, Steam made their own new currency, and so they control the inflation schedule, as you described. So, you know, they they control a large fraction of the currency, um, and they can do things like just give the currency to people for free because they already own enough of it, and they control the rules and, and everything that they are able to just distribute it. Now, we can't do that with Bitcoin because the only way to do that with Bitcoin would be to buy a huge amount of it, and we don't have enough money to do that. We can't just give it out for free. So that's sort of a it's it's an it's it's a cost to us. Like it would be cool if we could just give people free money, but there's also an advantage to doing things this way. Um, Bitcoin really has value, and and the users don't have to worry so much about obscure you know this obscure economic properties of of the form of digital currency that we're using. Uh, the supply of Bitcoin is limited. Um, there isn't anyone that controls a majority of it. It's it's extremely decentralized with respect to who owns it. Um, it's very distributed across a large number of people. Um, so you don't have to worry about there being like a small number of whales that have disproportionate power or influence or something like that. And can um, you just define whale really quick? Sure. So, you know, a, a whale on Steam uh, is one of the s handful of people, there are about 20 of them, that together control about 95% of the Steam currency. And if you talk with Steam users, this is one of their number one complaints that because so few people control such a large fraction of the Steam currency, uh, unless you create content that appeals to those people, you can never earn any money on Steam. And this is this is the number one complaint of, of the people that we've talked with that are Steam users. So we can't have a, the same problem because it's just not the case that anyone owns that much of it. You know, the only way to pay a content creator on yours is to just give them money. So, you know, the it, it's just, it's sort of, there, no one has an unfair advantage. Like the only way to cheat is to like just actually give a content creator a bunch of money, which would be good for the content creator. So what is the revenue model of yours? Are, is yours paying out the content creator or does it depend on the actual end user to fund their account in some way with Bitcoin and then they can send that Bitcoin and reward whatever content creators that they would like? Yeah, great question. So you know, one of the costs of doing things the way we're doing it is that if you want to actually reward a content creator, you do have to have Bitcoin to be able to send Bitcoin to them. Uh, no one sends Bitcoin to us, the company. Like the, the users are sending money to each other. So you possess, when you use the Yours app, you actually have digital cash, digital, you know, Bitcoin uh, in, in the app itself that you control the private keys. And you're sending Bitcoin directly to the other users. So in order to be able to do that, you have to have Bitcoin. And so this presents a problem, uh, which we call the onboarding problem. How do we get Bitcoin to people if we can't just give it to them because that would be too expensive? And we have a number of different answers to this. First of all, if you are a content creator, you can earn Bitcoin without having any Bitcoin to begin with. So if you just create quality content, people who already have Bitcoin pay you for it then you are now onboarded uh, to Bitcoin. So that's the first and the best way uh, to, uh, to earn Bitcoin. Uh, we're also going to simply make it easy for people to buy Bitcoin. So if you're someone who is not a content creator, but you are interested in paying for or purchasing or rewarding content creators, uh, we'll just let you load it up with a credit card. You just type in your credit card information. We'll integrate with Coinbase. Uh, Coinbase has a, a tool that we can integrate into our, uh, into our app uh, to make this easy and possible. Uh, and then the final way, something that we're going to explore later on, is if you're not a content creator and you don't want to pull out your credit card, we're also going to allow people to create advertisements, targeted ads, um, where you can earn money for your attention. So unlike every other social media site, when you post an ad on yours, the company doesn't earn money for the ads. The users who are giving up their time are the ones that earn the money for the ad. I mean, it's their time, their time and their attention. Uh, it should be them that are earning the money. So those are the three ways, uh, earning money through creating content or just using a credit card to buy it or looking at an ad. Um, and the revenue model for us as a company uh, is, is that we take a portion of the payments that people are sending to each other. Right. Okay. So there's just a margin there that you guys are taking off the top to facilitate the the marketplace, if you will. You know, I, I think it's interesting people getting paid to watch ads. And I wonder if we're going to see this more and more in the future since micropayments will be possible. 
I can remember this business model in the late '90s. Actually, the, there was a an internet service provider that teamed up with Kmart. It's like Walmart, but they offered free internet access, or you know, it's like 14.4 or something way back in the day. But they would give you free internet access if you loaded their CD and watched a couple minutes worth of advertisements. I think you had to watch like 30 seconds worth of advertisements for every 15 minutes you were you use their free internet. But I think that that business model does have legs, and I do think that people will sell their time, you know, 10, 15, 30 seconds at a time to to be able to onboard and collect some Bitcoin fees in order to use the network. Hopefully then they can turn into a, a content creator or it will be interesting to see the different incentive structures yours has to reward people for certain types of action in the community. That's one thing that I really liked about Steam so far is that they were able to incentivize people to engage in the community. And it brings me to the proof of work versus proof of stake debate. From what I've seen and what I've learned, it seems that proof of stake is a a really good way to build an online community and have people stake their coins and build reputation in that community. You know, with Steam, if you earn money by posting content that people appreciate, you get paid in their own currency and you can stake it in, meaning you don't cash it out to like Bitcoin, for instance, but you stake it into the community, which increases your reputation and gives you more power, if you will, or influence over the community. Will yours have something similar because you, you know, you don't have proof of stakes? I'm wondering how your reputation building is going to be. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I, I think uh, you know there there is a there's a big difference between proof of work and proof of stake, uh, because of the way that yours works. Um, you know, we use Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is based on proof of work, and proof of work requires that people actually have these computers doing you know these computations to secure the Bitcoin blockchain. But that's not something that has anything whatsoever to do with the yours app. Our users, it doesn't matter to them how Bitcoin itself works. All they know is they have money in the app and they can send and receive money. Um, and behind the scenes, like if you want to be a miner, I mean, you could go out and buy mining equipment and do this, but I don't think that our users, I don't think that most of them would bother to do something like this. Um, with proof of stake, the, the, the tables are, are sort of turned a little bit. Like as a user, you can have the ability to secure the blockchain itself with proof of stake, which I think is very interesting. Um, but I would I would sort of separate like there are technical reasons why proof of work and proof of stake need to exist to secure the the blockchains, and those reasons have nothing to do with the user experience of a social media app. Our our questions are more like you know it should be the case that reputation has something to do with your level of success on yours, but that has nothing to do with the Bitcoin blockchain. So for instance, uh, you know uh, we will probably what what we will do like the way content will be displayed on the front page. Uh, there's an algorithm like Reddit uh, where you know the, the more successful your content is, uh, the more prominently it will be displayed uh, for some period of time. Um, and that just has nothing to do with the underlying payments technology. It's purely just a sort of a product or software question about how that works. Right. So you guys have built your own algorithm to build reputation. I mean, your, reputation is so important in online communities, even before facebook or any of this i can remember being on just message boards where the number of posts you had was like your your online strength or your community respect or whatever you want to call it and i know people really go after that stuff i assume that you yours did have a reputation type system i just didn't understand how since it wasn't a proof of stake type of chain let's talk about bot i you you have written about bots. You said it was one of the problems with Steam that isn't going to be a problem with uh, the Yours network. But I'm, you know, briefly touch on that. But I'm more interested to talk about how you see AI bots playing a larger role in a digital entrepreneur's life in the next, you know, 10, 20 years. But also how you see bots integrating with the consumer-facing society. Sure, that's a great question. So there, are, there are sort of two questions here in. We'll, we'll talk first about what bots are on Steam specifically and what the problem is. Um, the way the Steam uh, sort of economic system works, 
um, upvoting someone is free. Okay, you can just you can just click a button and upvote someone, and you're not actually sending money to anyone. So what people did was uh, they wrote bots that automatically upvote uh, all of the content because if you upvote content that is then later successful, uh, you can actually earn money from that. So this just created a, some weird. You know, people made these bots that are basically spamming and, and creating a creating a problem uh, for for Steam. So bots can't be a problem on yours the same way they are on Steam, uh, just because upvoting someone on yours actually costs money. So it's not like you can just write a bot that just upvotes everything. Uh, that's not possible. I mean, you would run out of money if you did that. You would have to be, your bot would actually have to be smart and would have to actually upvote only the good content. Uh, if you wanted to earn money doing that, so the the second question is like, what is you know what is the big picture of bots here, and what's what's their future role uh, on social media and in the world? And I'm actually very optimistic about about good bots. Um, I think that you know I, I think the idea that you could have a, an economic agent uh, with its own money uh, and and that could do things is a really really powerful idea. Uh, that that will be very very useful on social media and other uh, in, in other ways in the future. So, for instance, imagine a bot that actually does a good job curating content that you like. The bot actually finds good stuff and it knows what you are interested in and it curates it and creates it for you. And you can you pay the bot for this service, but you pay it because the, because the bot is actually doing a good job, and so the bot is profitable. And so, with the money that it that it earns from this, it can pay for its own servers and stuff like that, and it can it can live. It's like a it's like an actual economic agent that survives, um, and perhaps it becomes better. And because it has to be profitable in order to survive, it can't just be a spammer. You know, it has to actually do things that people are willing to pay for, or or it would die. So I think it's a very interesting and fascinating idea. Um, that with cryptocurrency is possible because, of course, bots can't have a bank account, but they can hold cryptocurrency. Yeah, you said in one of your articles, if you want to own the robots, you should build the robots. What does that mean? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. So I think you know this is sort of I'm I'm a very entrepreneur and sort of a you know a, a economics minded person. I think it's I think it's you know when I think about what's going to happen in the future, I think. Uh, machines, computers, artificial intelligence, uh, cryptocurrency, these things are going to be much, much, a, a much larger fraction of the world economy in the future. Uh, I think that, you know, ec economic agents that are machines are going to exist. So if you want to be successful and you want to be rich in the future, it's a good idea to own some of these machines, right? Like, I mean, imagine, you know, right now we're in, a, in an era where uh, there are uh, several companies developing self-driving cars. In fact, just about every car manufacturer, I think, is now sort of working on this. Um, eventually, everybody who works as a driver and gets paid by driving cars or trucks, those jobs are almost certainly going to go away in five or ten years, okay, at fairly near term. So what are those people going to do? Well, my advice to them and to basically everyone is what you should do is you should just own the machines because someone, whoever, whatever people or companies own those self-driving cars are going to be earning money for all the work that they're doing. So, you know, what you want to do is to not do the work directly yourself. What you want to do is you want to own the machines that are doing the work because that's going to be the most powerful asset in the future. Uh, if you want to be rich, you want to be well off. Uh, and you want to be, you know, you want to survive uh, in the future, um, own the robots. Yeah, it's like Kate Erickson from Entrepreneur on Fire says, you need to find what tasks you have to do and then either automate, delegate, or batch those tasks. When we're talking about bots, we're talking about the first one. We're talking about the automation process. And as longtime listeners of this show will know, I'm constantly talking about systems, 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 and how important systems and workflows and defined processes are to become a successful entrepreneur. Well, bots are just the next generation of those systems because it's got intelligence built into it without you having to give it every single task. So Ryan, let's start winding the show down here. I'd like to ask you about the freedom aspect of being an entrepreneur. You know, we've, we've talked a lot in the entrepreneurial mindset, but how in your own personal life has 
being an entrepreneur opened up and offered more personal freedom? Yeah, that's such a good question. I, th I think it's sort of, a, it, it's a very important life question for me. And I, I think that I, I wish more people understood the value of, of being an entrepreneur or being a business owner. Um, I mean, it, it's made a huge difference in my life. Like just, I, I want to, I'll give a, a shout out to someone named Robert Kiyosaki. Uh, are you familiar with Robert Kiyosaki? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. I mean, he's, I come from a middle class, uh, you know, American background, lived in the suburbs and I grew up with a very middle class mentality of what you do is basically you go to college, you get a degree, you get a job and you save money and you, you, you buy a house and you put your money in, in, in your house and eventually you retire at the age of 65 and, and you sort of spend, you know, you have, you're invested in index funds and mutual funds and things like that. There's nothing wrong with this way of life, but you're not going to be, you're not going to be, uh, you're not going to be wealthy. You're going to spend your entire life working uh, for money, and you're always going to be at risk of like if you lose your job, you're just screwed, you know. And there's a better way uh, of, of of living. I think I I feel like this would be very useful knowledge if more people understood this. What you want to do is you don't want to have a job and earn money and spend all of your money on your your house and your car. What you want to do is you want to own assets that create cash flow for you. So owning a business is just the most clear and straightforward type of asset that you can own. You can build a business for yourself. What you're really doing when you build a business, you're building an asset, you're hiring people, you're, 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 you have you know, machines and servers that are doing things for you. You're building an asset that creates value for the world and earns money and you pocket some of the money. So this is, it's a way of like, you know, imagine, you know, if you're a business owner, um, of course, like any, you know, you can't take a vacation whenever you want to if, <laughs> if, uh, if, if things are sort of spiral out of control without you. But if you set it up well, uh, you, can, you can take a vacation and you will keep earning money. Or if you get, get in ill health, the business continues to run without you. Uh, so you're free. Your, your level of freedom is far higher as a business owner than as someone who works as an employee uh, at, at somebody else's company. I can't claim to, I mean, we're very early stage in this business. Uh, we have not even actually launched our product yet. So this is more like a philosophy to me than it is. I, I can't share my own success story because I'm still in the middle of trying to make it happen. But it's certainly my philosophy. That's how I see it. And that's what I'm trying to do because I believe it, it creates freedom for me. And you made a good point that you could get ill or you could go on vacation and your business is still going to be generating cash flow and revenue for you without you having to be there. It's so important. This is the step that takes you from just a, a business person, like a solopreneur type person to a real entrepreneur is when you're able to start delegating these tasks out and actually building this business asset that you can depend on. You know, you talk about bots and how we're going to be able to offload our tasks on bots. Another theme that I like to use is virtual assistants or people that you may never meet, but you work with online who can do different tasks for you, manage your social media or check your emails or help you with your scheduling or do research. You know, I've got a couple virtual assistants, Dexter, who helps me here at Liberty Entrepreneurs and Cherry. They're both living in the Philippines. She helps me with my virtual assistant business. And it's just so important to be able to find out what it takes to build this asset and then start writing it down and delegating this stuff away because you as the entrepreneur, you are the thinker, you are the builder, but that doesn't mean you have to build everything. You figure out how your systems work, how your business works, make those altercations and changes and start delegating or automating as many things that you can to continually free up your time. Hopefully you continue to get that cash flow as your time gets more than more free. Uh, I've got to ask you go by Ryan X Charles. What does the X mean? <laughs> Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll give you the story. So the, the story is, I wish I had a, a, a more entertaining story, but it's very simple. Uh, my real last name is Dick Herber, D-I-C-K-H-E-R-B-E-R, -E which has the word Dick in it. Now this is, it's, it's kind of silly, but when I left my career in physics and went full-time Bitcoin, I realized that I could sort of, this was my opportunity to change my name. Uh, my, I've had so many conversations with people where they point out that my lab, they're like, that must've been fun in high school having that name. I'm like, yes. Okay. So I've had, having that, had that conversation thousands of times, I just dropped the last name and went by Ryan Charles, uh, cause Charles is legally my middle name. 
and I added the letter X to make it unique. It was the coolest, simplest way to make it a unique name. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't stand for anything. Um, although I've debated telling people it stands for Xerxes or Xavier or something like that, which would be cool. Or Xylophone. I think that'd be a good one. <laughs> Just your middle name, Xylophone. Um, Ryan, what, what advice do you have for your entrepreneurial peers while they're working on their businesses and trying to start generating their own cash flow and building their bots and building their digital assets? Assuming you, you're already you're already of that mindset and you're already an entrepreneur, you're already trying to build your own assets and and uh, you know own your 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 own life. Um, the, the, one of the most valuable things I've done recently is to educate myself about the Silicon Valley way of doing business. So I live in Oakland, California, which is not technically in Silicon Valley, but it's it's sort of it's part of the Bay Area. Companies in Silicon Valley, which don't necessarily have to be literally geographically located here, some of them are not, they have a certain way of doing business. They do things like they find a co-founder, they raise money, uh, they, uh, you know, they, they hire people who are better than they are. And I wrote an article called uh, The Silicon Valley Startup Company Template. Well, one of the smartest things I did was basically to just study other Silicon Valley companies. I studied entrepreneurs and I studied the companies themselves. And there's a lot of wisdom here because rather than have to figure out from scratch how to start a business, I'm able to just do things the way that I know works. So I'm following tried and true business principles uh, that other companies in Silicon Valley uh, have, have applied to great success. This is how people have created many billion dollar companies in the past. So by doing things that way, I'm able to offload like, you know, basically I'm able to focus on our actual product and not have to, you know, reinvent the wheel, so to speak. So that was valuable to me. And I, you don't necessarily have to do things the Silicon Valley way, but I think just educating yourself about how other people uh, do things uh, is very useful so that you don't have to reinvent uh, what it means to be, you know, so to own or to create a business. Is there any entrepreneur in Silicon Valley or just in general that you would recommend someone follow? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, the, the top person on my mind recently is Peter Thiel. Now, the reason why Peter Thiel is on my mind is because he was like the only Silicon Valley entrepreneur who was openly in favor of uh, Donald Trump. And uh, he, he sort of ostracized himself from many of the other uh, entrepreneurs in the space uh, in, in Silicon Valley. But actually, he sort of was right and he sort of won the bet, so to speak. Um, and I, I thought that was very brilliant. It was a very brilliant move of him because Peter Thiel is actually a libertarian. I, he's probably, you know, he doesn't really consider himself a Republican, although he did say so recently. Maybe I'm wrong. But I think that what he did was really a very strategic move to become influential in the government. And he was right about that. Well, if you read into Peter Thiel's past, like this was a very, a very Peter Thiel move for him to make. He's a very admirable entrepreneur. He's one of the co-founders of PayPal. He's one of the co-founders of Palantir. He was an early investor in Facebook uh, and a number of other companies. Um, he's, he's extremely impressive. He's, he's one of my mentors. Um, I would say right now, just because he's been on my mind recently, he's certainly not the only one, but he's, he's definitely, you, you, there's a lot you can learn from Peter Thiel. Uh, so I would look to him. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's been such a pleasure to have you on the show. Ryan X. Charles, you're definitely a Liberty entrepreneur. How can my audience get in touch with you? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, you know, twitter.com slash Ryan X. Charles. I also have a website, ryanxcharles.com. Uh, you can also feel free to email me, uh, ryan at yours.org. And of course, visit our, our website, our company website at yours.org. And when do you expect it's yours.org to go out of beta? So right now what we're doing is we're doing one-on-one -on -one demos with people uh, where we're basically getting direct user feedback about our product. And we will launch when our users tell us it's good enough. <laughs> we believe that will be the case in early 2017. So we're really trying to launch as soon as possible. Um, I don't want to give a specific date, but it's, it's absolutely as soon as possible. We're rushing as fast as we can. And really, it's just a matter of making sure our users actually believe it's good enough, and then we'll launch it. Ryan, thank you so much for coming on. I, I really appreciate what you're doing, and best of luck with yours.org. All right. Thank you very much, Ash. This was a great conversation.